Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening. You welcome once again. We are going to start the program. We'll have an opening prayer and then continue from there. Shall we pray? Please, um, everybody should mute their mics until you are asked to talk. Shall we pray? Mm -hmm. Father Almighty, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this opportunity to meet and share knowledge to help save the lives of newborns in Ghana. We pray that you come and take control of our deliberations, make everything successful. We learn a lot that we're going to use to help our patients and make newborns survive. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So this evening, team BAR is going to do a presentation on neonatal jaundice, what the health worker should know. We have a lot of exciting things to do. We have an, a presentation, and then we'll all discuss some case scenarios. But before we start, we would want to have a message from the national executives. And we have Dr. Abekwe Pebi here to give us a message from the national executives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, PSG. Uh, it's an exciting time, exciting month, and we are all excited about the UNITA Journalists Awareness Month for 2021. And today we are going to have a very important aspect of the Awareness Month, where we are going to arm ourselves with the tools that we need to carry the message forward. And I always like to share an experience I have when it comes to retail journeys. So I reviewed the baby, was a three day old, who otherwise looked very fine. The only problem was the baby was quite plethoric. So I reassured mother that baby looks plethoric, baby may become a bit jaundiced. So just observe if you notice any jaundice. Please bring the baby back. Don't wait till the two weeks that we are supposed to come back for postnatal review. And this was about 10 years ago. 
mother came back after two days when baby was just five days old. Obviously, severely jaundiced. We started phototherapy, started preparing for extreme transition. Unfortunately, within 24 hours, this baby died. Um, I have any concern about a baby who will keep. And another experience I also had during practice was this medical student whose sister gave birth and around the third day, baby became jaundiced. And the medical student assured the sister that, oh, this is physiological jaundice. So don't worry, it will clear. By the seventh day, jaundice has not cleared. Baby was more jaundiced. Baby was rushed to the emergency room. Unfortunately, we lost that baby as well. These experiences has taught me that once the baby is jaundiced, don't joke with it. You have to go all out, do all that you can. So I believe that with these uh, scenarios in my mind and at the back of my mind, and I'm sure others also have their own experiences when it comes to jaundice, where even as health workers, we have not applied the right tools to take care of the babies. It is based on some of these reasons why we need to really arm ourselves as health workers to be able to add me. Can you please help me by muting those whose mics are on? Thank you. So it is based on some of these stories that we have heard, where even as health workers, we have not applied our knowledge in the right direction. We have. Thank you. That we have had to organize this training section. So please, let's take our pens and papers and jaw tests and listen to the experts who are going to tell us about all that we need to know as health workers to later join this. So thank you very much. And I wish everybody all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pebby. We are very grateful for the message. We'll move on straight on to business. We are going to have a stimulating presentation by a great pediatrician. She is a pediatrician at the St. Elizabeth's Hospital Huidium in the Ahafu region. Um, she has a great passion for children. She's also the newborn focal person for the region. She has a great passion for children, has done a lot and is doing a lot of changes in Huidium and its environs. We are pleased to have Dr. Dora Dapa present on Unital Journeys, what the health workers should know. Thank you very much. Afternoon, or is it good evening? Thank you very much, Dr. Jackie, my boss. Um, Dr. Pabi, thank you for the experience you shared. Um, some of us, we've not been working for that long, but we have some experience. I remember as a medical student, we used to see a lot of jaundice kids. Dr. Jackson, can you please let them unmute themselves? There are plenty of noise in the background. Okay. Hello, Dora, please hold on it. Admi, please. Uh, whoever has signed it as Techno, Techno Pop 3, please mute yourself. If you unmute yourself again, you may be forced to take you out of the meeting. So please. Thank you. Dora, you can continue. Sorry. And also, a summary. 
So what is jaundice? Jaundice is the yellow coloring of skin and it's like caused by skin of bilirubin. I will know what where bilirubin um, comes from. And this is a child who is yellow. Some of the mothers will tell you, na me kasa me bani kala no no efe. So I think sometimes we also have to be careful. So a mother thought the color, that's the color of the child. But the child was really done this, deeply done this to the soul. And so newborn done this or neonatal done this is done this from birth to 28 days. And you all know the progression is called that moves from your head down to the toes. That's the progression is like. So when you are looking out for John, you should know what to do. Then we go something small about epidemiology. My incidence is 60% of term units and 80% of, of preterm units. Please. So with this, we just have to ask ourselves 60% of term units and 80% of preterm. So if in a facility, if we are midwife at the chief compound or at a clinic, and you are doing hand bread deliveries, and let's say like 80 of them are term babies. It's not the percentage of them that gets jaundice. And if you have a preterm delivery like 20 in a month or so, you should know the percentage. 80% of the delivery should do. Oh, and they should get jaundice. So this means we should be very careful. We Hello, should be Dora. watching. Hello. Hello, Dora. <laughs> Can you put it on slideshow? Yes. Thank you. Oh, it's not on uh, slideshow. Put it on slideshow for Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Please hope you can see the screen moving. Yes, it's moving, but it's not on slideshow. Okay. 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 So as we know, so the incident varies with ethnicity and geography. Is it really important about ethnicity and geography? What is important is we have to detect and we have to know that 60% of the term babies and 80% of preterm will get jaundice. So we shouldn't really worry about ethnicity and geography. You should worry about the baby you deliver, that the likelihood of that baby getting jaundice as a term and as a preterm baby. Then one research said neonatal hyperbilirubinemia has long been with mankind since like 1,000 years ago. And it is the commonest condition to come across when attending to new needs. Worldwide, I said earlier, 60 to 80 percent. And in Ghana, last we joined the luncheon, and what the Ghana news agency reported: 10,684 cases were recorded in 2020. And I think we even underrecorded or underreported because a lot of them they will come, we will see them. Oh, mother, we we hardly document maybe even in their ANC card or in the hospital folder because we just look at them and go. So I think this is even under reports. Then let's say I have, we had a data from St. Elizabeth Hospital. From January 2018 to July 2020, neonatal jaundice accounted for 49% of all the admissions at the newborn units. Just the admissions. There were babies that came that they were screened with the TCB. Later, I get to know the TCB. They went home. Some we didn't even document, but the admissions that came, 49%. Then this year alone, from January 2021 to 30th of April, 316 admissions at the newborn units, for which 250 of them had jaundice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a baby can spray term later develop jaundice, as we see, develop jaundice. Some of them, even at the end of the day, during the discharge. We don't even document that jaundice as part of the diagnosis. So that can be more than we expected. But the sad thing is we had three mortalities. We recorded three mortalities. We did two exchange transfusions. They were successfully done for those who, were, those who are alive, but we had three mortalities. And two of the caregivers, they noticed that jaundice early, but they sought care late. So it's not only about noticing the jaundice, please. We, should, we also have to intervene early so when we are we recognize that john this early and if you don't intervene early you've done course 90 work then the remaining one also didn't notice that john this early and sought medical care very late very sad these deaths from the history we took and everything all these deaths could have been prevented then we say john this john this yellow is the declaration of the era 
and the skin. So let's look about the let's let's look at the physiology of bluebeam metabolism. We all know bluebeam is from the red cell when it breaks down. Then the heme part and the globin part. So the heme part, that's where you get your bilirubin. Later you get the bilirubin. Then after the breakdown, the bilirubin is unconjugated. And the unconjugated bilirubin is toxic. It's lipid soluble. It's toxic to the brain. So it's because it's lipid soluble, it can cross the blood brain barrier. I have to be careful so that I don't go. It crosses the blood brain barrier, meaning it stains the brain. And that's where the danger happens. But the one that is bound to albumin, that one cannot cross the BBB. So that one will be taken to the liver. The liver will conjugate it. A lot of things go through the ligands and all those things. All those things can be learned later. Then the liver later through the bowel that it gets to the intestines. Then that's be the conjugated form. The conjugated form is water soluble. It's not lipid soluble. So they're going to, the conjugated form doesn't cross the brain, the blood brain barrier. Then the conjugation happening in the intestine, there'll be stecobilinogen later the, to be excreted in the feces, the stecobilin, which will give the feces that change of yellow color. Then some will go through the enterohepatic circulation. If you look at the drawing, the portal vein, hope you can see. The portal vein, then some gets back to the liver, back to the circulation, and also some get to the kidney as the urobilinogen. So there's something more about bilirubin. So the unconjugated form, the bilirubin, that's the toxic one that crosses the brain. The conjugated one too is toxic, but that one doesn't cross the brain. It's not lipid soluble. The unconjugated one is lipid soluble. So if you look at this diagram, it means anything that blocks any of the pathways can cause jaundice, whether it's pre hepatic before the conjugation, that's from the breakdown to the liver, whether any, if anything happens to the liver, if the liver is diseased or immature, it can cause neonatal jaundice or jaundice. When it's post-hepatic, whether there's something wrong with the bowel that the biliary system, it can cause jaundice. If there's something wrong with the intestine, that's obstruction also, it can also cause jaundice. So if you look at the pathway, any a condition or anything that blocks the pathway can cause neonatal jaundice. This is a similar picture here. Then as we said, hemoglobin forms like 80%, the rest of the myoglobin, all this and other. We've talked about everything here, the conjugation, the transport to the bowel that. And in the sterile newborn gut, there is an enzyme called beta glucuronidase which converts the bilirubin glucuronide into unconjugated bilirubin, which is reabsorbed into the circulation, which is reabsorbed into the circulation. So this place, we have to take note of it. Why? When there is the, the enterohepatic circulation, this also causes, when there's in, increased enterohepatic circulation, it also causes neonatal jaundice. Then, with frequent feeding early, colonization of the gut occurs. These bacteria reduce bilirubin glucuronide mm -hmm. into stecobilin, which is excreted in stool. That's inhibiting the enterohepatic circulation. Very important. That's why we are saying early breastfeeding, early initiation of breastfeeding keeps the jaundice or the yellow away. So the newborn gut, uh, gut if you feed the baby early, the bacteria, these bacteria, it reduces the bilirubin glucuronide into stecobilin. That's why I also say the CS kids, some will say the CS babies, they get jaundice early and all those things. All these things um, come into play. So if you feed the baby early, breastfeed early, stecobilin is excreted in stool, you are inhibiting the enterohepatic circulation and I help. So this is the enterohepatic circulation. Then types of jaundice. If a baby is jaundice, what should you think of? One is the Bilirubin unconjugated or is conjugated. Then if the bilirubin is conjugated, all conjugated hyperbilirubinemia are pathologic. All conjugated, they are pathologic. Patholo pathologic means it's a disease state causing it. But unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, that's most the ones that it's in the circulation before it enters the liver for it to be conjugated. That's the unconjugated one. It can either be physiologic or pathologic. Now, what is physiologic or pathologic jaundice? Physiologic jaundice, that's... Oh, 
only unconjugated hyperbilirubinia can be physiologic jaundice. Mostly appears after 24 hours. But please, let's be careful here. It appears after 24 hours. So sometimes when you are seeing a mother, then you ask the mother come day four, the baby, the, the mother brought the baby day four of life. And you ask the mother, when did you notice the jaundice? The mother will say, oh, Andrew, that was, that's day three. The mother will, might have noticed the jaundice on day three, but that doesn't mean the jaundice appeared on day three. The jaundice might appear within 24 hours, not the 72 hours. So please, let's be very careful here. The mother might have noticed it on day 72, but the jaundice might appear before this, even 24 hours of bed. Then also, total bilirubin rise may be less than five milligrams per day. Then the maximum intensity between the three, day four, fifth day, and the, that's in 10 babies, then seventh day in the preterm. Then also the serum level will be like 12 to 15 milligrams per deciliter. Some people use milligram per deciliter, others use micromo per liter. So if you want to convert from milligram per deciliter to micromo by conversion, they say you multiply by 17.1. Then physiological jaundice, that's clinically not detectable after 14 days. That doesn't mean some physiologic might not get after 14 days. And most of the time it resolves with treatment. Hope we understand. Then of course, what makes a jaundice to be physiological, the unconjugated one? Mostly we say physiological because it's the physiology of the baby. What is happening? There is decrease RBC survival and increased erythrocyte mass. Mostly the survival of RBC is 100 to 120 days, but in neonates, it's like from 80 to 90 days. It means the lifespan is short. There is nothing happening. The physiology of the baby makes the lifespan short. So 80 to 90 days instead of the 100 to 120. So the red cell will be breaking. And from what we've learned, if the red cell breaks, there's hemoglobin, then the heme part, then that's when bilirubin forms. The, meaning the baby can become jaundiced, especially if the, um, maybe the albumin, there is no more albumin in the blood because the unconjugate has to bind to albumin. So this can cause physiological jaundice. Then also when there is poor hepatic uptake, mm -hmm. the child is not sick, there's nothing happening, but the liver is immature. Because of the immature liver, there is poor hepatic uptake. And this one too can cause physiological jaundice. Then when there is increased enterohepatic circulation, that's why then if you need the, if you want to decrease this physiology, then it means you have to initiate breastfeeding early. And that one with the bacteria, it will help reduce the beta glucuronide. Then at the end of the day, you decrease the enterohepatic circulation. So as I said, the key thing, early breastfeeding will keep the yellow away. So this is physiological jaundice. And um, only unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia can be physiological. When it comes to pathological jaundice, it can be either be unconjugated or conjugated. Mostly, it appears within 24 hours of age. That doesn't mean most, even some of them appear after 24 hours, but if any jaundice appears within 24 hours of life, please, it is pathological. Then you have to really watch the baby and do the need for. Then when there is also increase in bilirubin of more than five milligrams per deciliter per day. If you have the capacity to do your serum bilirubin, or even if you do a TCB screening, and maybe you realize this, the rate of rise per day is more than five milligrams. If you are using the micro mode, just multiply by 17.1, you get your figure. Then if the serum bilirubin at the time you are checking is like more than 15 milligrams per deciliter, it's likely to be dealing with pathological jaundice. Then jaundice, um, Sorry, it's not persisting after 24, it's persisting after 14 days. Sorry for the typo. And if there are any signs of underlying illness, then you know what you are dealing with. So we've talked about physiological jaundice, only unconjugated causes physiological jaundice. Then also the causes of the pathological jaundice, it can be either unconjugated or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And for the unconjugated, it can be either hemolytic, that's breakdown, or non-hemolytic causes. So the hemolytic causes of the pathological jaundice, that's the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, the hemolytic causes. The ABO incompatibility. 
A, B, O, is all about blood groups. That's blood group A, B, O, and A, B. And from literature, that's the most common cause of hemolytic disease of the newborn. And in the all the facilities I've been to, PDM currently, I mean, PDM is the most common cause of the hemolytic disease of the newborn. But luckily, most of the time, they have the mouth disease. Why the MBO incompatibility? Mostly when the mother is O and the baby is B or A, that's where you get the ABO incompatibility. There is production of, we don't want to talk plenty terms, IgM, which doesn't really cross the placenta, then later IgG will take place, which will cross the placenta and all these hemolysis will happen. So that's why when we are taking the history and everything, you have to know the blood group of the mother. Then if you are investigating the baby, you have to know the blood group and know what you are dealing with. Then resource incompatibility is the most common cause of severe hemolytic disease. It's not the most common cause of the hemolytic. The most common cause is the ABO incompatibility, but the resource incompatibility is the most common cause of severe hemolytic disease. That's RH positive baby and RH negative mother. It's all about the IgM and the IgG, as I said, and it worsens with subsequent pregnancies. That's why most of the time, when you are taking your history, you have to know any previous pregnancy, not any previous delivery or any previous IU, the previous pregnancy, even if the pregnancy ended in um, spontaneous termination or medical termination, you should note the pregnancy, any previous pregnancy, not a, a, any pregnant, just in the old para one dead or para one alive, it's whether it's spontaneous um, abortion, whether it's a medical termination for any reason, any previous pregnancy, very important. Then we know it worsens with subsequent pregnancies. So most of the time when mother is, we give the anti D and all those things. So when you are taking the history, you have to know and be very careful about this ABO incompatibility. Then the GSSPD, that's glucose phosphate deficiency. Um, in our setting, a lot of people have GSSPD, but sometimes I always say they don't know. I, my mother only realized she has GCSP at the age of 65 when she accidentally poured camphor in her uh, oats when she was not wearing her spectacles. That's when the history and everything came together. And, and I am GCSP the food effect. So I use that history. And when we clacked my mother and everything, realized she, even as an adult, it ended up in hemolysis. The age was five. I have to donate blood so that we transfuse my mother. So imagine an adult. So we should never underestimate GCSPD deficiency in the newborn. If, and note the mode of inheritance. Sorry for the typo, not to note. We should note the mode of inheritance. It's excellent. So if the mother is GCSPD, the male uh, babies or the sons, we should be very careful. So when we are clacking or when we are um, talking to a mother who has GCSPD or seeing a newborn of any mother, if you know the GCSPD status of the mother, I know who screen for the baby too, if you have the capacity. So we should never underestimate glucose phosphate distribution. It's because that enzyme, it's, what should I say? It um, protects the cells from stress, this oxidative stress. So if you don't have it, at the end of the day, your cell will be susceptible to all those sulfur containing things, the naphthalene balls, that's the camphor, your herbs, some, because most of the herbs, they have these sulfur things in it and some other medications. Then also sepsis can cause unconjugated hyperbilobinemia. Then kephal hematoma, that's we all know this um, scalp uh, in mostly kephal hematoma is unilateral and it doesn't cross the suture line, mostly at the parietal area. We always see it, oh, this is kephal hematoma. Hematoma, madam, go in two or three days. We should be careful because that one too can cause unconjugated hyperbilobinemia, which is pathological. Then if this is not all the list, but we know these are the common ones we encounter in our settings. Then the non-hemolytic causes of pathological jaundice, the, um, the hepatic, the griglaniger, the gilbert, all those things have got to be with the ligands and all those things. Later we can talk about it. Then we finish with the um, unconjugated. Then we are talking about the conjugated hyperbilobinemia, as we said, always pathological. Most common causes in our setting are these ones. Yeah, the list, we can't exhaust the list, but these are the settings. Sepsis, risk factor. But for neonatal sepsis, we should, know, we should note the risk factors. Mother prom, 
Did the mother have chorioamnionitis? Is it any maternal febrile illness, maternal UTI? That's why we always ask this, not that we are asking for fun. We ask this to know the status of the child, if the child is at risk for other things. Then the jaundice is conjugated in about 30% of cases. The most of the time, when you look at our lab, sometimes you see jaundice, oh, indirect, more, uh, sorry, the unconjugated is more than conjugated, we just ignore. But conjugated, if it's more than 20% or so, some book will say 15 to 20. I dare to say if it's more than 20% of the total bilirubin, then you, might, you are likely to be dealing with a conjugated form of hyperbilirubinemia. Then neonatal hepatitis, the torches, that's the toxoplasmosis, the rubella, the cytomegalus virus, and the syphilis and what have you. Then galactosemia, all this, the baby can present with fever, lethargy, poor suckling of fever, galactosemia, the liver will be palpable, the baby will lose septic. All these can cause the conjugated hyper. And then biliary atresia. I know next week, the Ashanti region will deal with the surgical causes of um, neonatal jaundice. But biliary atresia too is a surgical cause. We have to note it early so that we prevent the complications. Then the risk factors, race, geography, genetics and familiar risks, nutrition, birth weight and gestational age, congenital infection, as we said earlier, birth weight, very important, and gestational age. If the baby is born small for age, less than 2.5 gram, sorry, kilogram or 2,500 grams, you know these babies are, if the gestational age too is less, I deal with a 34 weeks, 30 weeks, extreme preterm, you know the baby is at risk. Some of us were born preterm, when we were born, we said we had John Day's umbilical hernia and a whole lot. So because we're small for age, we, all, we encountered all this and God save us through the health workers. Clinical presentation. What do we see? There is yellowness of the eyes or the body. There might be fever. Not always that there is fever. There might be fever depending on the cause of the John Day's. The baby might not be able to suck then there'll be passage of pale stools. And when you see the passage of pale stools, it means you are dealing with some obstruction at the intestinal area. So you might be dealing with those biliary atresia or even at the biliary tree, there's something wrong. So you know what you are dealing with. Then then you are dealing with the inability to suck. Either you might be dealing with sepsis or your jaundice where the tail is crossing, is getting to the brain and this baby might be in acute bilirubin encephalopathy. Then detection. As we said, history and examination, very important in, in medicine, in nursing, in health, everything. Even when you are writing um, chest x-ray or writing labs, you always have to write history and something so for the examination to guide you. So history examination, very important. Then you should know the jaundice type, whether you are dealing with the conjugated or unconjugated. History can help you in self clinical examination. Then you exclude the treatable disorders and the medical emergencies. When there is acute bleeding and cephalopathy or there's something that which is getting, right, it's like eminent, if you have to stop it, then you stop it. Then early detection of the surgically correctable extrahepatic causes. Next week, we deal with the surgical ones. Then management, what do you do? You have this baby, depending on, are you at the CHIPS compound? Are you at the clinic? Are you at the health center, tertiary hospital, district hospital? What do you do? The history, we said it, the onset, you should know. The mother said day three, that's when she noticed, but the thing might have been there. Then the color of stool, is it the yellow? Is it the pale stools or the clay? The feeding history, is the child feeding well or the child is feeding poorly? Has the baby lost weight? Birth history, any history of birth trauma, if you're careful, hematomia, or subgallial bleed, or the subaponeurotic, very important. Then the maternal history, as we said, prom, maternal illness, chorioamnionitis, then also blood group of the mother. Are you dealing with restless ne O negative mother or either A negative or restless negative mother, any hemolytic disease, any siblings with jaundice, family history, maybe it might be GCS video, uh, all those enzyme defects or the red cell membrane defect that you are dealing with. So your history is very important. Then examination, what do you do? This is something small. You examine, you look at the jaundice, other factors, you like the newborn assessment. Obviously, what you see, any dysmorphism, the color of the jaundice. The most of the time, what we do is we use um, your thumb or so you press mostly, we say jaundice is cephalopoda, mostly we press the 
bridge of the nose, we blanch it to see whether it's jaundice, we blanch the sternum, you come to the uh, abdomen, the thigh, then also then, if you look at this progression, you say jaundice usually ap becomes apparent in the cephalopod. I'll talk about it. And when you are dealing with milligram, then you convert to micromo. It starts from the face, come to the upper trunk. And these figures, these figures is, I tell you the severity. The figure shows the severity. So as you are moving down, it means the jaundice is getting severe. And when you get jaundice at the palms or so, please, this baby has to be seen at a facility where exchange blood transfusion can be done. A sap. We shouldn't waste time. We shouldn't be saying things to console the mother. We should act on it because it means the jaundice is worsening. So the one, two, three, four, five that we are showing, it's not just numbers. We are not numbering the face, upper trunk. We are telling you the severity and how the jaundice um, progress. And that rule, we, that's the the Kramer's rule, please, it's Kramer's, not that I'm going, it's Kramer's rule or criteria. That's a picture of the newborn. We look at the head like one, we come to the chest two, three, then the thighs or the legs four, then the arms two is four like the, the legs. Then when you get to the soles and the palms, they are five, it means this baby will need exchange transfusion. So you note it, you just put it down. Sometimes you might not, or not that you are remembering one, two or three. You have to know that as the jaundice is progressing down, it means it's severe, then you should act on it. Then as I say, examination, you look for the general appearance, the small, the smorphism, is the baby pale? The baby can be pale because this is the hemoglobin or the red cell breaking. And blooming is, if it's hemolysis, you know that what is happening or if, whether it's hemolysis or not, the red cells might be breaking. So this baby might be pale. Then is the baby dehydrated, not breastfeeding enough? So this baby might be dehydrated. Has the child lost weight? Is there fever or hypothermia? All these uh, can disrupt the bilirubin metabolism, causing the jaundice. Is there hepatosplenomegaly? You might be dealing with uh, the conjugated one. If they have hepatosplenomegaly, there's pills. They, you, sorry, look at this too, which is pill. Is there evidence of birth trauma? We'll talk about it. Then important considerations and when to refer. You should assess the severity of the jaundice in the baby. As we said, you should take your history, your examination, the risk factors and everything will let you know the severity. Determine if the affected baby falls into the high risk group or not. And please, it's not only about even falling into the high risk group. Where we are, some of us, I mean, we are, and there are districts in Ahafo, Sankore, Kasapi, and everything. From PDM to Sankore might be two hours or so. The facilities nearby may be Gosso and maybe Amedia, but sometimes they too may they might have issue with the phototherapy. So there are some babies we see that at that time, they might not be high risk, but because of distance and other reasons, some of them, we keep them to observe. So sometimes it might not be too technical and book matter. You should look at the location too of the individual, where they are. Sometimes where they stay, you cannot let them go. Sometimes you have to just admit or even detain them to observe to see because of some other things. Where they are, if it happens, they might not come or they can't even come because transportation and a whole lot of issues. Then determine what type of management the jaundice baby needs and act promptly. Decide if the jaundice baby can be safely uh -huh successfully manage in that health facility or not. I said earlier, if you know you can't manage, if you know your phototherapy machine is not working, if you know you can't do exchange blood transfusion, you are dealing with a baby who needs, don't waste time. Discuss with the facility you want to refer, then let the baby come. The baby will be seen. Then promptly refer the high risk baby to higher facility. I've talked about it. Can exchange blood transfusion be done at your end? We talk, if you know you can't do it, refer that baby first. Please refer all babies with enlarged spleen, end or liver, sorry, enlarged liver, end or spleen, pale or clay stools, dark urine, to see a pediatric gastroenterologist. We know we have few. Um, in Confanot, we have Dr. Nico in Dr. Uh, sorry, and in Kolev, we have Dr. Afa. I know maybe there are new ones there. Sometimes even call them to discuss with them. Then if you have to refer the baby, you refer. Sometimes I want to be the hero, maybe, but as some, you have to also consider a whole lot of, are you doing good to the baby by keeping this baby? No, you are harming the baby. Like the surgical one, some of them can be treated and corrected early. 
before it ends up in a disability that you don't want. Then this is a device. There's a um, transcutaneous bilinometer. That one too is used for CCD screening. So before we get to the investigation, some facilities in our facility, we, what we do is maternity, whenever they are discharging the babies, they call us or even the maternity people, they're in charge or the labor ward. They screen the babies, they examine the babies and screen. We use the TCB to screen them. Then maybe when they come, the, with the NICU nurses, and maybe if you get a doctor, we follow them. Those We ask them a few questions, examine them, look at the maternal history and everything. Those who need admission, we admit them. Those who can go home, we let them go. We give them the numbers to call if they have any issue. And this in, uh, intervention has helped a lot. We know it has saved a lot of baby. This TCB, the transcutaneous bilinometer. So we should all talk to our medical suits and director. Dr. Kokra, I know your medical director. You better get one for your facility. Stop being chiseled. Then investigations, as you said, the transcutaneous bilinometer. It's a screening. A screening, but it really helps because in a certain some facilities cannot do the total serum bilirubin. They wouldn't, they can't do it. But if you have a TCB, it can give you an idea. You do your full blood count to see as your HB down and other things. Your reticulocyte count to show the cell is they are new RBC. So maybe this the child is hemolyzing. The GCSPD status will help the blood group. When it comes to the AB incompatibility and the races, the Coombs test, the liver function test will help when the baby is septic or conjugated hyperbilubinium or so. Then the thyroid function test, you know those hypothyroidism too, they can have all this. Then the INR, that's when you are dealing with those conjugated hyperbilubinium. You want to know whether the liver, there's anything happening and the bleeding or whatever of the child. Then the, if you can do blood culture and urine culture, maybe you are dealing with a sepsis case. Then the touchy screen. I know not all, a few facilities can afford it. Sometimes, even if you're at a place, you can afford the distance. The lab that can do the touch screen is a problem. Then ultrasound scan, the ultrasound, you do the ultrasound to check the liver and other things, and also the biliary tree. Then treatment of the unconjugated hyperbilirubinia. What is the aim of the treatment? We are saying treatment of the unconjugated hyperbilirubinia first because that's the one most of the time you can prevent the baby from getting the a brain a damage or so. You cannot prevent maybe the jaundice from starting, the onset of the jaundice. Maybe sometimes you can't do anything about but you can prevent it from progressing. You can prevent the baby from getting the disability by intervening early. You cannot prevent, as I said, the jaundice from starting, but you can prevent the disability and prevent the deaths that happens from the jaundice. So you reduce, the aim of treatment is to reduce the incidence of severe hyperbilubinemia, then prevent bilubin encephalopathy. Modalities, general messages, breastfeeding, 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 early breastfeeding, initiation early breastfeeding to clear the jaundice away. We've read the enterohepatic circulation also helps in neonatal jaundice. So if you decrease the enterohepatic circulation, you are helping the baby. Breastfeeding, breast milk is cheap. It doesn't cost much. I always tell my friends, my nurses, my in charge, me, I breastfeed. I know the importance of breast milk. And also, I don't think I can afford formula. So even after six months, when I'm starting formula, let me assume because I'm wasting my money to buy the formula. <laughs> then counseling, cancel, cancel, cancel. Sometimes we just say, my mother breastfeed or mommy, my no for you should cancel them. You should let them know why you are saying all this. You should let them know that complications, why you are doing what, what you are doing, it helps. Then also phototherapy and exchange blood transfusion. Pharmacotherapy, pharmacotherapy, we realize it's not that effective. So now most of us, most of the hospitals, they don't do any pharmacotherapy. Then phototherapy machine, the principles is there, you know, conversion. Then the light should be between 420 to 420 nano of light. Indication. Maybe when your teeth, uh, the bilirubin is more than 50 milligrams in the term. As I said, sometimes you should look at the baby you are dealing with, the individual, not book, book, book. And you should also know the contraindication. Maybe the mother had a child who, when was put under the photo, something happened. So you should take that history and know what to do. The technique, what do you do before you put the baby under phototherapy? You perform hand washing. Thanks to COVID or is it unfortunate or <laughs> COVID has taught us that we should wash our hands. Now we wash our hands like something. Everything we wash our hands. You place baby naked in the in a cradle or incubator. You cover the eyes with a sheet. Protect the gonads, very important. Then keep the baby at least 30 to 45 centimeters from the light. 
you start your photo, you should be breastfeeding frequently. We all know the importance of breastfeeding. Then it might not be clear, but this is a picture from St. Elizabeth Hospital. Our photo is two. So look at the kids. Sometimes you have to use something to separate them. All these kids are under this phototherapy. So maybe I know with time management, they'll buy plenty for us. They bought this. Then phototherapy again, you change position sometimes. You record the temperature, you monitor the urine frequency if you have to. Quite complication. There might be dehydration, skin rashes, bronze baby syndrome, or but, and these are the, we cover the eyes because you know, I think of retinal damage or maybe gonadal damage, that's why I also cover the gonads. Then exchange blood transmission, down to rapidly lower the serum bilirubin concentration. When there is connectors or when there is bilirubin induced neurologic dysfunction, you cannot reverse the damage, but you can decrease the damage that will cause or happen. But whatever has happened, you might not be able to reverse. So some of them will come, they are not suckling well. They might look a bit lethargic or a bit floppy. Don't wait till they are spastic or when they cannot suckle at all. Some, some kids will come there, we can't really suckle, but they are active. That one is showing you have to intervene and you don't wait till the thing happens before you intervene. So this, a baby, we're doing exchange transmission, but for some reason, we, might, we, we, we had to suspend or so. This at um, St. Elizabeth Hospital. Then, we are demonstrating to some intense, like they, they have not seen exchange transfusion. And if the child, there's no indication for exchange, we can't do that because of teaching sake. So we use the Coke bottle, if you can see clearly. We use the Coke bottle as the baby. We filled it with fluid. We did all our connections and we were demonstrating to them and they appreciated. So in the next time when we were doing exchange transfusion, they realized that ah, they've seen this before, but it was just a demonstration that we did. Complications of exchange, you might perforate the guts, there will be infection because you are entering a vein, thromboembolism or hemodynamic changes. You are withdrawing and pushing. So if you don't take care, you might keep this baby. As I said, pharmacotherapy is not important. Then the conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, mainly supportive. The surgical ones will be dealt with next week. Then complications of neonatal jaundice. Please let us prevent this disability and death. Whether it's called bilirubin encephalopathy, Bilirubin induced neurologic dysfunction, connectors. My boss, Dr. Mrs. Planju, tell the value is the same. Whatever name you give it, that value is the same. You should look for the initial or early phase of the acute bilirubin encephalopathy. So this is a baby. This is avoidable. We shouldn't wait till this stage. We can prevent it. Staining of the basal ganglia and all those things. Then treatment. What you do? Do the hyperbilirubin, You cancel them. You have to let them know the sequelae, the acute state, maybe the chronic uh, encephalopathy. They will have this uh, choreoarteral movement, speech issue, maybe the dental or enamel hyperplasia, and all those things will happen. Then you follow up the kid. So factors to consider in physiological or in jaundice, we should interpret the in hours. You don't lose say, oh, the child is one day. Use the number of hours. It will help you. Things to avoid, please. Exposure of baby to sunlight, we we'll stop it. It delays our intervention. It might even cause some burn to the baby. Please, we we'll stop. You shouldn't give them fake apple. Please, we we'll stop this. Then giving glucose or fruit juices, no known benefit to the baby. It's not important. Then the drugs, the phenobab, the steroid, there is no evidence. No sunlight, no sunlight, no sunbar. Please, let's stop it. It's past and gone, pain of the past. We are new, we we'll stop all those things. No glucose water, no fruit juice. So in summary, when this presents with yellowness of the skin and mucous membrane, the cause can be physiological or pathological, but you should also know that pathological is dangerous. So you should have that one at the back of your mind. Unconjugated bilirubin is neurotoxic to the brain and hence needs urgent attention. Prompt diagnosis and management helps prevent severity and complications like connectors. Modalities of treatment, Photo exchange, pharmacotherapy, no more in use. These are my references. Thank you very much. These are medical suits, our managers. Look at this special promo. Get us some, it will be very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Doradapa. Very, very stimulating um, presentation. And um, we have learned some things that John, this is a very common condition, no matter what we do. 
almost 60 to 80 percent of term babies will develop jaundice. 80 percent of preterms will develop. So it's a common condition that we should know. You help us also know the difference between physiological and pathological jaundice. Thank you very much for making us know that difference because it's a problem for a lot of people. You told us, you've also taught us to look for the risk factors, very important. History of prom, choriaminitis, any maternal illness, blood group of the mother. And then you ended up by saying that we can't prevent the jaundice from occurring, but we can prevent it from progressing to connectors. That we can do. Thank you very much. We are very, very, very grateful. We'll open the floor for questions, after which we have some case scenarios for us to answer. So the floor is open for, question, um, for questions. We have a lot of pediatricians in uh, BAL to help us. We have Dr. Rosemont Kukro from St. Teresa's Hospital. We have Dr. Nananya Akuble from Techiman Holy Family. We have myself. We have a lot of people here to help us answer our questions. So the floor is open for questions. You can put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Doctor, do you see my watch? My hair Hello, the floor is open for questions. Any questions? Doctor Jack, please. My question is: Yes. Is it necessary, or can we? Can it be a protocol that will test all babies, especially the preterm babies, for unital jaundice after delivery or before discharge? Yeah, before discharge. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, from our presentation, we've learned that preterms develop a lot of jaundice. So, screening for jaundice will be a very good idea. And what Dr. Dora talked about, getting the TCB, a very very simple. Uh, equipment that can help us screen all our uh, preterm babies daily for jaundice. So it will be a very good protocol if we screen all our preterms for jaundice. And the TCB is an excellent equipment for us to do that. Any more questions? The floor is open for more questions. <laughs> Okay, there's a question from Adlet about early initiation of breastfeeding for ritual exposed babies. Early initiation of breastfeeding in ritual exposed babies, especially for mothers who opt to breastfeed. So definitely now that we, we, we have mothers being on the antiretroviral during pregnancy, and then after pregnancy, they continue we encourage as many mothers who can breastfeed to breastfeed. So there's no problem. The mothers can breastfeed so far as they are on their antiretroviral drugs. And the babies can also have their, their own medications. I think um, because we know most of us in the districts and the low levels, most mothers cannot afford artificial for six months. Because if you choose to do artificial fees, you are doing that for six months. So you have to be careful what option the mother chooses. So we encourage so far as the mother has been on her heart during pregnancy and afterwards, after delivery is on it, he can go ahead and breastfeed. There shouldn't be any problem. Okay, any more questions? Okay, there's a question from Madame Abigail. Please, what do you do in a situation where mother is not lactating after delivery and mm -hmm. need to start early feeding to prevent jaundice in the baby? So we need to assess what the problem is, why the mother cannot um, lactate. Is it because mother has not started feeding? We know those who do CS, it takes a while for, for them to start or baby is not latching on, or is it attachment problem? Is it position problem? You need to assess and then help the mother to be able to establish breastfeeding. So you need to assess the problem and know what 
um, the, the real problem is, whether it's either from the baby side or the mother side. Dr. Jacqueline, I think it's true. I side with you. You have to really assess to know the problem. But most of the time, we are quick to say, why don't you want to breastfeed? Or why is this woman? And we all know even it's psychological. The whole thing is up there. So if the mother is depressed or there's an issue, so you have to cancel, talk to the mother, and the whole thing will flow if it's attachment problem. So you have to know whatever is happening. And we know our midwives and our nurses, they do well with these things. You put, they will talk to the mother, they will assess, and they will help. So you should never say, oh, the mother is not breastfeeding, so maybe you have to start something. No, the mother will breastfeed. Most of the time, they can breastfeed. If it's psychological, I will cancel them. If any issue, ask Dr. Jackie said, attachment or position. But I mean, who questioned you? Hello. Okay. I think there was another question on the use of keftriazone in newborns. I'm, I'm Dr. Rosman Kukru from St. Therese's. Um, normally, we advise that uh, keftriazone should not be used uh, in the newborns, especially in the first one week because of the uh, pharmacokinetics uh, of uh, keftriazone. Keftriazone uh, is carried in the body bound to albumin. And this same albumin is the one that's bilirubin level, uh, bilirubin gets attached to as it it's being transported in the in the blood. So if you give the child keftriazone, the bilirubin, the keftriazone will displace the bilirubin from the binding site. And remember that this bilirubin is lipid soluble, so they will be available to be to cross the blood brain barrier and cause the. Uh, encephalopathy that we are talking about. So as much as possible, we try and avoid keftriazone within the first week of, of life. But you need to weigh the uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages whilst you do that. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Somebody wanted to ask a question. Okay. So Dr. Jacqueline, someone yes, asked that why did I cover the baby? No. This was because of ethical reasons and other things. I didn't want to show the baby's face. That's why I just covered. Someone was asking why we can We don't cover the face. I just covered during the presentation for ethical and other reasons. OK, thank you. OK, Shika, you can go ahead and ask your question. Please, Shika. My name is Esther. Hello. I want to know. Hello, Shika. You uh, can go hello. on and ask your question. Hello, Shika. At what point? Artificial feed can help clay join this from the baby. Okay, thank you. Um, Shika, can you go ahead and ask your question? Hello? Hello, Shika, please, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Dr. Hello. Jan. Yes. Please, I want to find out, should all babies, um, should all preterm babies be admitted to the NUKU or um, according to the weight. Okay, thank you. We'll answer that. We want okay, to take hello. the questions in batches. Okay. Any more questions? Hello, please. Um, I want to know if baby comes and then the bilirubin, the figures you are getting from the telon bilirubin test um, seem to be okay and baby is visibly yellow. Do you go ahead to put baby under phototherapy? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Infinex Hot 10, um, you can go ahead and ask your question. Infinex Hot 10. Hello, Infinex Hot 10, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Hello, Joseph Apiedu, you can ask your question. Joseph. Hello, Joseph, you can ask your question. Hello, Joseph, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Hello, Joseph, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is on. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. We okay. use uh, phenobarbital a lot in units. Mm -hmm. I want to know whether is there any effect on the management of uh, jaundice, mm -hmm. or in other words, in management of uh, hyperbilirubinemia. 
in terms of has Finobab have any effect, any correlation or not? Okay, yeah. thank you very much. We'll answer your okay. question for you. All right, we'll thank you very much. Question. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, Caroline, you can go ahead. Okay, that is not even a question. Okay, so I'm going to ask Hello, Caroline. Yes, Auntie. Yeah, we couldn't hear you well. I was saying, I would really want us to do massive education at the antenatal level, especially we should inculcate it in the pregnancy school. Because sometimes it's so pathetic when children, babies are so jaundiced and parents who practically refuse admission, refuse phototherapy. And it's just so painful because they, you will say whatever you want to say and they are just not ready. Because of whatever reasons, financial reason, whatever. And I wish, I wish you would let the education go well. If the education goes well, once, even before she delivers, she knows this and that is what I'm likely to face. And these are the therapies that will be done. I think our work will be very simple if we should do that. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, let's Thank do you. more of the education. More. I think it will help. Okay. Thank you very much, Caroline. Esther Hema. Esther. Esther Hema, you can go ahead and ask your question. Esther, Hema. Yes, Esther Hema, you can go ahead and ask your question. Esther. Yes, please. Thank you very much. A mother okay. with twins that she can't breastfeed both of them because the breast milk is not enough for the two babies. And the baby is suffering from jaundice. Can the artificial feed clear the jaundice? Okay. Yeah, thank thank you. you. We've noted your question. Edith, Edith Nate, can we, you can go ahead and ask your question. Edith Nate. Hello, Edith. Hello, Edith, you can go ahead. Hello, Edith. Hello, Edith, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so I think we'll pause the questions now and then um, we've had some, some questions. We'll answer them before we take the next set of questions. Somebody, I should all preterms be admitted? Yes, so far as the, the baby is a preterm, less than 37 weeks, um, completed weeks is a preterm, it should be admitted. For how long depends on each um, baby because it would depend on a lot of clinical um, factors. So every preterm should be admitted. So far as it's less than 37 completed weeks, it should be admitted. But definitely the late preterms don't spend as much time in the hospital as compared to the very preterms or the extreme preterms. So all preterms should be admitted. Dr. Jackie. Hello. Yeah, this is Dora. Let me make some clarification. About okay. the covering, I didn't mean the baby under the phototherapy machine. I think some people got it wrong. You for the phototherapy machine, you have to put a face shield. You are protecting the retina to prevent retinal damage. I mean, during the exchange, we use some love thing that uh, picture to cover the child's face because of ethical reason, not the baby under the phototherapy machine. Thank you, boss. Hello, Dr. Jackson. Hello, Dr. Jack. Yeah, Hello, Dora. Please, are you done? Yes, I'm done. I'm done. 
Okay, okay. So please, um, I'll go on to answer the questions we have. We'll take a net, a net set of questions. So everybody can hold on. Let's complete the first set of questions. So somebody asks, if the baby is clinically jaundiced, but the bilirubin level is normal, do you go ahead to treat the baby or not? So we should note one principle in medicine that we don't treat, we treat patients, we don't treat labs. So if the baby is clinically jaundiced, baby is jaundiced head to toe, but bilirubin level is saying it's normal, you treat the baby. You have to go ahead and treat the baby. So your clinical judgment is more important than the lab. Because remember, lab is being done by people and human beings, and they can make mistakes. So in that instance, you treat the patient, not the lab. OK. So somebody asked, does phenobab has a role in the management of jaundice? Yes. So phenobab, one thing from the bilirubin metabolism that we learned, phenobab is one of the drugs that augment conjugation of bilirubin. So it helps aid conjugation. And you know, the more the unconjugated bilirubin is conjugated, then we don't have a problem because the more the high levels of unconjugated bilirubin, the more the problem. So phenobab has a role, but it's not for every, every baby. From research and, and guidelines, it's more for babies who have connectors or bilirubin encephalopathy. You can add oh, that to your phototherapy and other treatments. So phenobab yeah. has a role, but for only in special circumstances. Those are the, those it was also the helpful animals. when you are treating regular Niger syndrome. Mm. It's also very, very helpful. Uh, Artificial syndrome, the mother comes to you that is not like it in Okay, so somebody also asks if they are twins, they are not feeding well, the mother is not getting enough breast milk, can you go ahead and give artificial? We would say no. Every feeding, breastfeeding problem, get to the root. What is the problem? Is it a problem with attachment? Is it a problem with position? Is it a problem on the mother's side? Mother is not feeding, so it's not lactating well. Get to the root so that mother can breastfeed because breastfeeding has so many benefits. And we are also learning that breast milk help clear the yellow away. So get to the bottom of the, don't rush to give artificial feed. Get to the bottom of the problem and solve it and let the babies breastfeed. There's a question, but I can't see it, but uh, there are eyes Okay. 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 So please, we'll take the next set of questions. Um, Edith, you can go ahead and ask your question. Edith. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chen. Please, do we have any type of prophylactic phototherapy for babies that are high risk, be careful hematoma, even though Physically, the baby is not jaundice. You do a prophylactic treatment. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Infinite hot 10. Infinite hot 10. You can go ahead and ask your question. If, you, if it's not available, Lillian, Lillian, you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yes, Lillian. Lillian, please, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Lillian. Hello, Lillian. You can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, if Lillian is not available, Yvette, Yvette, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you. Please, can you hear me? Yes, please, we can hear you. Okay. Hello? Hello, Yvette. Yes. We, yes, so we can I have two questions. So the first and foremost is, so I wanted to find out, this is routine practice to supplement like IV fluids for breastfeeding babies on phototherapy. And then the second thing is because 
infections and then sepsis can cause jaundice. So do you routinely put babies who are jaundice under phototherapy, like whilst you are trying to investigate for the cause of the jaundice? On antibiotics, sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, too. Galaxy. Hello. Galaxy 830, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Galaxy 830. Okay, whilst Hello. we are waiting. Hello. Hello. So, yes. Yes. Yes, doctor. Hello. Please, I want you to find out. When you put a baby under the phototherapy, uh, about protection of the gonads, is the diaper alone enough to protect it, or you need to add something else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's a question in the chat box about artificial feeds clearing the jaundice, artificial feeding of the babies with jaundice. He wants to know whether artificial feeds can clear the jaundice. Okay, so Dr. Rosemont will answer this set of questions for us. Then we take another set, after which we'll go on to a case scenario. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll start from the last question, which says that is diaper alone enough to protect the gonads? Uh, I think that yes, because routinely our babies that we put under the phototherapy, we put them in the diaper and then we put the eye shield and then we are good to go with the phototherapy. So yes, the diaper alone is enough to protect the gonads. Then the next, the other question, the last but one question was, should antibiotics be routinely used in babies with the since sepsis is one of the cause? Um, that one I'll say no, because we, we said that a lot of reasons make the baby develop jaundice. So as part of your history and your examination and in, a, uh, in some, sometimes the investigation, you are trying to look for the risk factors that we talked about. If there is no indication of possible infection in the child, you shouldn't give antibiotics. Remember antibiotic resistance is something that we are dealing with. And therefore you don't go ahead and give antibiotics to every baby that comes to the loop. No, like Dr. Jacqueline said, admit all preterms. The admission is not equal to giving antibiotics to everybody that comes there. So yes, you don't give antibiotics to all jaundice babies, except those with the uh, signs and symptoms or risk factors for sepsis, they are the ones that you start antibiotics for. There was also a question about yeah, IV fluid use in jaundice okay. babies. Okay. Okay. Dehydration or not being able to breastfeed, where it's one of the things that we have talked about uh, making the child jaundice because it will not clear the guts of, of the uh, bilirubin and therefore they will still be uh, deconjugated and there will be increased enterohepatic circulation. So for most of our jaundice babies that we have, if the mother is lactating so well and can do breastfeeding with top-ups, it is not necessary that you put them again on IV fluids. Usually we try and do like one and a half of maintenance for our jaundice babies. So if the mother is able to breastfeed well if, and uh, the child is in the position to to uh, take the breast milk, then that one you don't need to give IV fluids. But some my, my, some some of the times our babies are very sick and they will not be able to tolerate enough of the breast milk. So in addition to the breast milk, we give IV fluids because the child may be doing NG feeds and that one may not be enough to cover for what the child needs and you supplement that with IV fluids. So that's the reason why we give IV fluids in, in our jaundice babies that we have. The next question, there was a question about whether there is any uh, evidence about the use of eye shields in babies during phototherapy. Uh, from, from science, we know that the, the uh, photo light can cause retinal damage. But I, uh, are, I remember that when I was in Confanochi, there was some... Um, some controversy, like, is it really necessary to do the uh, eye shield or not? I can't give an answer now, but for majority of the facilities, when the babies come, we put them on eye shield. I remember when we were in Kompanochi, for some of the babies, we were not doing it, but uh, routinely we do the eye shields for the babies during the phototherapy. 
someone asked about prophylactic uh, phototherapy for babies with increased risk. Um, some literatures are for and others are not for because um, some believe that for the phototherapy to be able to work, you need some level of uh, hyperbilirubinemia in your blood before uh, the, the photo will be able to work. And, and therefore, some school of thought think that you observe the child. When the child gets, because of the high risk, you need to closely monitor the, uh, the baby. And the baby, when the baby gets jaundice, then you do what you have to, the necessary management you need to do. But some also think that, yes, you could go ahead and do prophylactic uh, uh, phototherapy for, for, for the baby. So it's not, it's not okay, okay. one size fits all. I mean, some are for it and some are against it. So I'll ask my co-moderator uh, uh, to add uh, to the, what I've already said. Okay. So thank you very much. Somebody asked about whether artificial things uh, clear the jaundice. Um, no, not that we know of. What we know is breastfeeding helps clear the yellow. Okay. Encourage every mother to breastfeed because like we've mentioned okay. time and in time okay, over again that breastfeeding has benefits for both the mother and the baby. So we should encourage every yeah, mother so to breastfeed because it also helps clear the yellow. Okay, then to add to that, mm -hmm. uh, even in breast, breast milk jaundice, which is sometimes we know that the breast milk contains uh, the enzyme that Dr. Dapar talked about, which also breaks down the conjugated bilirubin to unconjugated bilirubin. Even in a situation where the jaundice is coming from the breast milk, you still advise the mother to continue breastfeeding. So we advise for breastfeeding. That's why we are not talking about artificial feeds here. We said that every mother should be allowed to breastfeed. So encourage breastfeeding. We know that there are some genuine reasons why a mother may not be um, able to breastfeed. And for those indications, yes, we, we know about it. But for, for the general population, we, we always try as much as possible to encourage them to breastfeed, try and find out the issues that they have. Maybe like Dr. Jacqueline said, the position, the attachments, and sometimes just encouraging the mother, you know, because for first time mother, sometimes they think that, oh, they will not be able to breastfeed. But if you encourage them and let them know that, oh, initially sometimes it's difficult, but as you go on, it will be fine. You, you get them going and they are able to breastfeed. So always try and encourage breastfeeding. Don't be in a hurry to jump over to artificial feeds. Okay, thank you. Hello, doctor. Yes. Hello, doctor. Yes, please go ahead. Please, um, I want to ask, um, I have a personal experience with what we are talking about. Okay. After okay. three years, um, 24 hours to 48 hours, the breast milk wasn't coming. Um, maybe you could see that the child is hungry and then kind of, he was even getting dehydrated. He even got dehydrated, I should say so. So by then I was in the pediatric nurse anyway. <laughs> so what happened was we started giving, he started running temperature. So we went to do FVC and then the VC on to a high. So we started with IV and pistolin and gentamicin, trying to manage sepsis, monitor sepsis. Still the breast milk wasn't coming. I was taking a lot of fluid and all that, but it was still not coming. We didn't, I didn't agree for them to initiate from last week. So we were doing IV fluids. And then the um, third day, the breast milk started flowing small, small. So I had to continue with that. The, um, the baby became jaundiced, but it's, it's, it, it was kind of, it was fading out by and by. So I want to ask, um, sometimes the baby Baby's crying, mothers are worried, desperate, and no phones, your name, but about two days, like getting to two days, baby is not eating. And then um, at my place where I work, the midwives kind of, before I became a pediatric nurse, you know, after 24 hours when the breast milk is not flowing, they, they initiate their formula feed. So I want to ask, 
if the breast milk is not coming at all with all the other things you'll be doing for the mother though um if can i mean can you start the formula feed okay okay thank you very much so uh, as we said you've gone to the root cause um attachment position mother is feeding well we've encouraged mother genuinely if it will not come definitely we can't let the baby starve you have to go to artificial but we also want to encourage let's do our best and encourage every mother to breastfeed but there are there are very genuine um, cases where some mothers are unable to lactate but there are very very few cases so I would still encourage that we as health workers encourage the mothers to do breastfeeding. But if we've gone to the root cause and mm. done everything, it's not working. Definitely the baby has to feed. We'll have to go to artificial. But I would still encourage, let's, let's encourage the mothers and support them to breastfeed. Yeah. All right. And Thank please, you. those who are not on the floor, can you mute your mics? There are a lot of feedback in, in, the, in, the, in the background. Hello. Can you mute your mics? Elizabeth, Isaac, Kwabna, Sandra, can you mute your mics? Caroline. Hello. Hello. I, want to, I want to ask a question. I want to say something. Okay, Caroline. Um, doctor, please, I didn't hear when you were talking about the female, but my line was a bit, my line went off a little, so I didn't hear, so I want you to repeat again. again. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Are you okay? You can mute your mic for us. Thank you. Isaac Kwabna, can you move to a mic unless you have something to say? Okay, thank you very much. So we mentioned that phenobab helps with conjugation. It aids conjugation of bilubin. So it has a role to play in neonatal jaundice because what it does is it helps augment conjugation of the unconjugated bilubin so that more is converted from the unconjugated to the conjugated bilubin. So it has a role to play but only in specialized babies. So it's been reserved for babies with severe neonatal jaundice, complicated by connectors or bilubin and kephalopathy has a role to play. For those babies, apart from your phototherapy or exchange, you can also give phenobab. And then when you've diagnosed what we call Griglaniger syndrome, it's one of the causes of congenital causes of unconjugated bilubin. If you make that diagnosis, phenobab is of great use in Griglaniger syndrome. So it's only in those specialized cases that um, phenobab is recommended. There are some few questions in the chat box. I will go ahead and answer, answer them. After that, we have some three nice case scenarios we'll all go through to help us understand what we have learned. Okay, so somebody wants to know if IV fluids is helpful in the management of neonatal jaundice. I think we have, we've addressed that already. We said that IV fluids is very, very important, but if the baby is breastfeeding well and mother can express and top up, it doesn't need IV fluids. If only baby is jaundice and it's not feeding well, it's feeding poorly, then you can add IV fluids, also augments your management of neonatal jaundice. Somebody wants to know the use of glucose solution in babies is not good at all. It confuses them with breast milk. So as you give the glucose water, they get used to it. They become lazy to breastfeed. So glucose solution or glucose water is a no-go area for babies. It's not encouraged. Somebody, Doris wants to know if after your initial serum bilubin test, when do you recheck the levels? All things being equal, you have to check your bilubin level every day. If even you can do earlier, you can do six hours to every 12 hours, all the better. So if you have the facilities to check, you can do six hourly serum bilubin check. But if it's difficult, every day you need to check your serum bilubin until the levels become normal and baby is clinically well, then you can stop your phototherapy. Emmanuel Mante wants to know, is the use of early morning sunlight effective for low serum bilubin if phototherapy is not recommended? So some bath we've mentioned that from our presenter is not good 
but it's not effective for treating neonatal jaundice. Why do we say that? The early mornings and like and this needs almost. Be. So we say sun bath or sunlight therapy is not effective for treating neonatal jaundice. If the baby is jaundice, you should go to the hospital assess and then do phototherapy. But on the other hand, the jaundice is physiological. I mean, so let's not encourage one other. You prescribe speech, right, for the whole community. So another baby is jaundice. This mother will, will advise, go and do samba. But how do you know that jaundice is not pathological? So we don't encourage samba for neonatal jaundice. It's not if effective. Okay. So Monica wants to know that after five days phototherapy, there's no longer any importance to put the baby under the light. So um, we can prescribe a general thing for a baby. It depends on the baby. Generally, we know that the risk of connectors or bilobin and keflo, the seven day from test area is developed and risk of connectors is low. So generally, you do phototherapy up to seven or 10, 10 days. But we've, we've seen babies who are more than seven days who have developed connectors. So sometimes you can go up to seven days. But generally, phototherapy is not after 14 days. You wouldn't want to go that. Usually, after you usually don't recommend phototherapy. Okay. Nana says, in cases where the direct bilirubin is high, please, what do you do? So, we'll discuss that conjugated hyperbilirubinemia next week. But definitely, you need your history and your examination to find the cause. I think our presenter gave us causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, some are neonatal hepatitis syndrome, biliary atresia, galactosemia, and other things. So you have to investigate for it and get to the cause. OK. Somebody wants to know, will phototherapy still be helpful in a two weeks baby with jaundice as a result of kefal hematoma as after 14 days, after 14 days, phototherapy is really not recommended. And usually jaundice after two weeks will need further investigations. There are causes for prolonged jaundice. You may need further investigations. Okay, so thank you very much. We'll end, you want to go to our case scenarios. Um, Dora, please, can you project the case scenarios for us? Dora. Dora, please, can you project the case scenarios for us? Okay, so we are waiting for Dora to project our case scenarios, then we can answer them so it helps us to understand what we've learned. People are asking for the slides, we'll put them on the page. This is where we put the uh, advert. So don't worry, we'll share. Please, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so our first case scenario. A three day old baby is brought for the first postnatal visit in your facility. Mother noticed baby is having yellowish discoloration of the eyes during the baby's <laughs> morning bath. Baby is other postnatal with the discoloration of the eyes during the morning's bath. Baby is otherwise well. What questions would you want to ask the mother? 
What is Pastor the most yeah, likely that <laughs> how will you manage this baby? hello hello sorry the sound went off sorry about that so um i think there have been some submissions some people would want to know when the job on they started okay thank you these are all very very good submissions any more questions we would want to ask how long does he breastfeed the baby will be your okay and another question somebody wants to know when did he know what is the jaundice that's also very important and then how early did he start breastfeeding so somebody says he thinks it's physiological jaundice that would be his diagnosis how would you manage this baby How would you manage this baby? So somebody thinks it's physiological jaundice. I think we've asked a lot of good questions about breastfeeding and then when the jaundice was noticed. How would you manage this baby? Anybody to help us? You can put it in the chat box. You can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and then help us answer the question. Okay, so thank you. I think these are all very good submissions. From what we've learned to today, another thing I would want to add is before you say any jaundice is physiological, rule out all other risk factors. Before you diagnose any baby as having physiological jaundice, rule out all 
pathological or all risk factors. Risk factors. So very good. We want to know how baby is breastfeeding, breastfeeding, lactation being established. You want to know when did the jaundice start? Because we've learned today that the jaundice on the first day of life is always pathological. So we want to know when it started. But from this case scenario, same baby is otherwise well. So you want to know about baby's activity. Is there any associated fever? Is the baby febrile? And the activity of the baby, has the baby convulsed any other problems? You want to look for risk factors. Did the mother have prom or chorioamunitis or any febrile illness? You want to look in the, into the mother's ANC card and check for the mother's blood group, mother GSSPD status, and if there were any other risk factor in the mother. If everything is fine, then this baby who is three days old, and then you go ahead to assess, you need to assess the jaundice. Where is the level of the, we've learned the cremes rule one to five. Five is the, is the, is the, the highest. So you want to assess where is the level of the jaundice? Is it just on the face? Is it just on the trunk or up to the palms and stools? After your assessment, you combine all the jaundice is just to the face. This baby is well, there are no risk factors. Then you can comfortably say it's physiological jaundice. And for this baby, you encourage, after you've ruled out all these risk factors, you encourage the mother to breastfeed and to continue to observe if the, the jaundice gets worse, it has to come. But this baby, if all these are fine, you can go home. If you have the transcutaneous, you can check your bilirubin to even know the level. Everything is normal. You can let the baby go home. But very important, you should review in two or three days, come back for you to see again. And very important, also advise the mother in case before the three days the jaundice gets worse, you should come back and see you. So that's for case scenario one. We'll go on to case scenario two. Okay. Please, can you go to case scenario two? Can we move to, okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll take a uh, case scenario two. Um, I read, a four day old baby is brought to your facility with complaint lowish discoloration of the eyes and skin for the past two days. Mas not been breastfeeding as she used to do in the first three days. First question, what further questions would you want to ask the mother and why? Um, how will you investigate this baby's illness? And the last question, how will you manage this baby? Please, if you want to answer any of these questions, you can put them in the chat box or you can uh, unmute yourself and talk. Hello. These are the everyday cases we see in our facilities. Please, anyone to help us? Okay, so um, in the chat box, uh, there are some submissions that have been put there. So, uh, Someone wants to find out if the babies, if the baby cries well, and then 
whether the baby has a seizure or not. I think that these are very good questions that uh, we, we, we want to know. Please kindly unmute yourself and, and give your submission. So, Marian would also want to find out the gestation at delivery. But we said that the gestation is also important. So, at what gestation was the baby? And then, Nora also wants to know if the mother, from the mother, if the baby passes tools, and if so, what are the color of the stools? That's also very good. And then, hello, anyone to unmute and give us his or her submission? Hello. Hello. Okay, so. Hello. Yeah, please. We are listening. Okay, so with the investigations, I will do uh, full black counts because of the fever that is accompanied with the baby, and then I will also look out for the SBR, the liver function test, and GCSPD to ascertain my uh, diagnosis. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. So he says that you do a full blood count. You also do a you. liver function test and then the serum bilirubin levels. Thank you very much. Okay, so Stella, do you want to help us? Okay, Annette. Annette, you can unmute yourself and give your submission. Annette. Please kindly unmute yourself and give us your submission. Host, please, if you can unmute Annette for us. Oh, sorry, Annette left. I think the network. Okay, so in the chat box, yeah. You, uh, someone wants to find out the mother's blood group, which is very important, any maternal history of uh, uh, any illnesses, any discharges or redness from the cord, very important because one of the things that makes our babies ill is, is cord infection. And usually our mothers will want to apply anything. So it's very important that you check that there are any discharges or redness from the cord. Then uh, Joyce wants to find out if, the mother had any infections during pregnancy and the mode of delivery, the activity level of the of, of the baby. Okay, very good. But I need you to unmute yourself and give your submission. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes, please, please, uh, with investigations, I would also want to do BFO, malaria parasite, ruler congenital malaria. Okay. Yeah, I think, yes, we agree. Because at first we thought congenital malaria wasn't common. But now we know, I think from Northern region, was telling us more about the increasing levels of uh, congenital malaria cases that they are seeing. So yes, we, we, uh, you are not wrong if you do a, a blood form for MPs. Okay, please, how are you going to manage this baby? How are you going to manage this baby? Is this a baby you would want to send home is this a baby you would want to admit? If you admit, what will you be doing? Please kindly unmute yourself if you want to give a submission. 
or I could read in the chat box. Hello. Okay, so now says that uh, okay, now says that with the management would inform the mother of admission, start uh, phototherapy whilst waiting for the results of all the investigations done, and put the baby on antibiotics as well as IV fluids. If baby is stable and can feed, we can cap and spoon feed the baby. And I think that that's that's good. Uh, Nana also says that with the management, you admit, give IV fluids, start phototherapy, start antibiotic based on the outcome of the full blood counts. And Joanna also wants to assess the severity of the jaundice and determine if the baby falls into high risk or low risk. Okay, so the one who wanted to give the submission, you can now do so. I think much has been said already. What I want to say, they've said it, the antibiotic oh, okay. and then the nutrition aspects, assessing to see if the baby can suckle. If not, you do cup and spoon or you pass NGT to feed. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so for case two, we realize that this baby is showing signs of possible infection in this child. So you want to find out where the source of infection is from. Is it from the mother or is it something being done to the baby? And therefore you ask further questions in addition to looking for all the other risk factors that we have talked about today. So the mother's blood was very important. The mother's GCSPD, very important. Was there a prompt? Because from my practice, I've, I've noticed that some people have prolonged prompt, which is a risk factor. They come to the hospital for some, reason we don't notice it we send their baby so when they later the baby and join this so yes we want to find out was it prolonged or not and then any uh, infection in the mother and then the baby the cord you are very important what that mother has been applying to the cord it's, it's very important, together with all the other questions. In terms of investigation, yes, full blood count is very important. The serum delivery level is very important. If you are able to do a liver function, that's also good. Then if you are in a facility where you can do blood culture, this is also a child presenting with fever and jaundice. From Dr. Dapes' uh, presentation, you realize that uh, sepsis is one of the things that makes the children jaundice. And therefore, you also want to do uh, a blood culture if we are able to do it. In terms of management, this baby is not a baby that you want to send home and schedule for an early review because this baby has signs pointing that he has infection. He has danger signs, there are danger signs in this baby. So you'd want to admit, but you have to counsel the mother that this baby will need admission for uh, the, the best or uh, optimal care. And then you take your samples, as it's already said, you start your phototherapy. You, if the child can calf feed, you do so. But this child who is not feeding well, you want to uh, start IV fluids, start antibiotics, and then start phototherapy. Then whilst awaiting your labs, and then when the labs come, you manage this patient. It repeats the serum bilirubin levels to if blood culture comes and you're on track you continue until the baby's bilirubin levels are down and the baby is clinically well then after that you could assess the baby for possible discharge after you have wane of the phototherapy and observe that there is no rebound hyperbilirubinemia okay so Dora, can you please uh, take us to the last case scenario so that we'll be out of this place? Thank yes, you so much because uh, Sister Plant, uh, we are so grateful. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Dora, can you project the second case? Hello, Dora. 
So our last case scenario, then we are done. There is history of yellow cards and skin. I'm not saying I'm 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 your facility with the day's history of yellowish eyes and babies active and breastfeeding. Please give us the reasons. Please, as usual, you can put it in the chat box or you can mute yourself and then unmute yourself and then answer for us. Pathological journalist or pathological journalist. From Is this physiological or pathological jaundice? Is it pathological jaundice? Okay, so if you say pathological, what are your reasons? So, Portia, you said it's pathological. What are your reasons? Portia, what are your reasons for choosing pathological journeys? Hello? Yeah, Portia. Yes. Hello? Yes, Hello. Portia, you can go ahead. Yes, you can go ahead. Yeah. Please, uh, I'm thinking is. Um, yeah, Portia, you can go ahead. We can hear you. Is, is pathological because if um, the scenario says baby is feeding well, then we expect that the physiological jaundice should clear by by then. But if the eyes is still yellow, then it's a sign of a danger sign. So. Hello, I think we lost Portia. The, 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 Hello? It's not clear. We Hello, Dr. Jack. I cannot hear you, Papa. Hello. 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 Hello, Portia. Melody. Hello, Portia. Yes. Okay, you can come back. We couldn't hear you at first. Can you repeat your submission? Ah, uh, okay. Yes, the scenario baby is active and breastfeeding well. So we are then John this if it's um it's a relay, it should clear by now. But since uh, the discoloration is in the eyes, is uh, it shows that the 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 jaundice is on the high. Is it clear now? Hello. Oh, 
my network is bad so i hello Hello, what is happening? Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Dr. Jacqueline, Dr. Kokro, what's happening? We can hear. Hello. Hello, doctor. Yeah. Um, I would want to say that. This baby is done this physiological. But the reason that, um, you know, hello, hello, the network is bad. Yeah, very bad. Uh, so this is a seven-year-old baby. Baby is active and breastfeeding. So is it physiological or pathological? You give reasons. I would say mostly physiological. John, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. We all know it might be pathological, but the child is active. It might be ABN compatibility from your history, but the child might be active. It might be resistant, it might be GSSPD, but the child is active. So maybe you shouldn't just look at the activity and the child be breastfeeding well and conclude that if it's, it's physiological. It might be physiological though, but mostly it's a diagnosis of exclusion most of the time. This child might ABO because we said ABO compatibility is there. It's a common cause of the hemolytic and then records. Hello, boss. Hello, yeah, Dora, you can go on. Sorry, our network went off. Yes, so here too, but so as I said, mostly the physiological one is a diagnosis of exclusion. We just we shouldn't just look at the activity of the child. This child is seven days old. The mother just noticed that day he's strict. Baby is active and fresh. It might be ABO incompatibility. Might be other causes of the jaundice, which is mild or hasn't really progressed much. So the activity and the child breastfeeding well alone doesn't mean it's physiological. That one should be a diagnosis of exclusion. Most of the time, when you think it's not more, it's something not pathological, I might think of physiological jaundice. So as Dr. Jacqueline said, with the physiological, we should be very careful when we are diagnosed. Although it might be physiological though, but the activity and the child breastfeeding well alone doesn't make it physiological. You should investigate further the blood group of the mother. So the history alone will give you much history examination and some small investigation you can do at your end. Thank you very much. Thank you much. We want to end here. We thank you for your great audience. We want to thank the National Executives of Pediatric Society of Ghana for giving us a BAR the opportunity to host this training of trainers. We are very grateful to you all participants, our, all our partners. We are also extremely grateful to Dr. Dora Dapa for giving us this wonderful presentation. Thanks to Dr. Usman Koko. We are very, very grateful to you all for us. Well, some of us are leaving. Have a mass casualty. We are leaving. Okay, okay, okay. bye bye. Dr. Pabi, do you have any, any any message for us? Doctor, please, we need this slice as soon as possible. Because okay. Okay. it's very good. Okay. Yeah. You yeah, we'll send it on the, the pages that we put the posters on. We'll share it again. Okay, okay. Dr. Pabi, please, your closing okay. remarks. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, um, the team from BA. Uh, it's been a very wonderful time, very exhaustive. I know there are lots of people who have a lot of questions and information to ask. I think for me, 
the take home message should be that do not say a baby has physiological jaundice unless you have ruled out pathological jaundice by at least checking the level to be sure that it is not below the 15 milligram per deciliter. So after checking the level and doing a few investigations and you don't find any pathological cause, then you can say it's physiological. So it should be a diagnosis of exclusion. That way we are likely to save our babies who have jaundice who may end up getting um, some brain damage or disability. So thank you all for participating. It's been a very wonderful time. And we are looking forward to Ashanti region leading us on the surgical side. So let's all stand by and prepare for it. Let's continue the advocacy program. Let's continue sharing our experiences on the page, our photos and the activities that we are going through. Let's continue on to make the United join this uh, thing of the past. Let's encourage early breastfeeding to prevent disability from unita jobs. Thank you all very much for this massive Thank participation. You. See you next Thank week. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we have the closing prayer? Father Almighty, we thank you for a wonderful meeting. Thank you for all the deliberations. We pray that the knowledge we've gained today will be able to use it to save more newborns. We are grateful for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless Amen. you for all the hard work. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. God bless you. God bless Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Hey. Hello. I feel like <laughs> Okay.